Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you all here for our second last lecture of this um, part of the series as part of our Sacred Hour observations. We're really delighted to have you here with us this morning and very delighted that we will be listening to the wisdom of Dr. Joy Paul, Assistant Professor of Business Administration. Dr. Paul focuses on international management and investment as well as business ethics and many other areas. Um, and she says this in her profile, when I encounter a group of students for the first time and every time, my challenge is how can I give them my best so that the good that is in them is most likely to emerge? That's just a taste, I assume, of the wonderful um, wisdom and insight that we have the opportunity to gain from Dr. Joy Paul this morning. Please help me welcome her. Wow, thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. The last lecture. I never thought this day would come. <laughs> and, and neither did my students, I guarantee you that. You know, it's actually pretty ironic because I'm not really much of a lecturer. I'm more of a storyteller. I, I think I'm a decent conversationalist too, but stories really, for me, uh, are the glue that, that holds everything together. I've heard and I've told so many stories, uh, I couldn't really count them all. But I think if I were, to able, uh, were able to put them all together, they would form a web that would connect all the parts of my life. Uh, so that's, I'm going to do that a little bit today. I'm going to tell a few stories. And this story theme must be pretty evident to my kids, too, because the other day, our 15-year-old son, who uh, is hopefully at the peak of his sassiness, uh, <laughs> came home, and he was sharing a story about a, a classmate of his uh, whom I had not heard about before. And just as I was opening my mouth to ask a question, he preempted it in his mom falsetto and said, so what's his story? <laughs> which, which, which is exactly what I was going to say. So, uh, so that's really the theme of, of my talk today. Just do it, connect all of it with stories. So here are, to get us started, I, I couldn't resist. I asked my mother to send me a few photos. So. I thought I would uh, kick it off with a, with a couple of oldies but goodies, maybe, uh, to get us started. And I think I, I put these in here uh, maybe to remind me about how far I've come. On the other hand, maybe they're reminders about how much we tend to stay the same. You know, if I look at that first birthday with my great-grandmother, you know, I'm fairly alert, which is good. Uh, and I'm near, uh, I'm near a relative, and in this case, a great one. I was always surrounded with, with grandparents, parents, uh, cousins, and aunts and uncles. And my shoes are pretty worn out, uh, or worn on the bottom for only being one year old. So, you know, in my family, you needed to keep moving to keep up. At age eight, oh my goodness, you know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, I, it was clear I, I didn't care too much about fashion even then. Uh, <laughs> And I know you're thinking, honey, there's a lot more wrong with that than fashion. Uh, but, but, for, but for me, it's really all about relationships. And the relationships start building right from the beginning, right from the time that you're born. And really, life is all about relationships. So what about relationships? Well, I would say make real relationships. And that means sharing yourself letting people into your lives and getting, uh, getting to know them in a genuine way. And everyone knows people who are great at relationship building. I would say copy those people. And for me, they were my parents uh, and, and my grandparents, but my parents are, are extraordinary at, at the relationship thing. Now, I grew up on a, on a farm uh, outside a small town in southern Minnesota. So, Life on a farm is about a few things. It's mostly about being together, working together, playing together, and spending a lot of time together. So what happens when you spend a lot of time together? Well, for me, every summer was filled with a, a job that we did collectively, we did together, uh, called walking beans. Now, walking beans, they walk through soybean fields, and I'll use my little, uh, I can't, I don't have, uh, walking through soybean fields pulling out weeds. 
So uh, this comic strip that I, that I came across a while ago says, and by the way, my father would play the part of Lucy here. Uh, this is a hoe. Yes, uh, I've seen pictures. Every person in this world who has ever amounted to something started by using a hoe. Linus says, suddenly, I'm on the road to greatness. <laughs> I'm convinced that my father thought that. Uh, so all this time that we spent together was great. Uh, you know, sh sharing stories, uh, talking about, you know, fairly profound things sometimes, uh, but sometimes silly things. But all the while, we're building relationships, and it wouldn't have happened if we aren't, weren't out there toiling away hour after hour. Uh, now, a couple things that I learned from my dad. The first thing is, don't be afraid to laugh at yourself. After all, you are pretty funny, okay? And he, he still does a wonderful job of laughing at himself. The second thing I learned from my dad is to go for it. Just do it, just try it. What's the worst that can happen? Just take a chance. And uh, you know, here he is. He, he went downhill skiing for the first time in his life when he was 47 years old. And of course, we had to go out to Montana, big sky to do it, the first time ever on skis. So, you know, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty cool, you know, but to be a farmer, you have to be a little bit of a risk taker anyway. So, uh, so that's just a couple things that I learned from my dad. My mom uh, is an amazing woman. From her, I learned to expect excellence from yourself. She would say, you know, no pressure, just do it. Because you can do it, you will do it. It's just expected, no big deal. She was uh, a career mom when that wasn't very common. She actually had quite a career in banking. She ended up being the first female vice president at this bank that she worked at for her whole life. But she was an extraordinary mom, an extraordinary wife, and she made it look really easy. But I know now it wasn't. Uh, the other thing I learned from my mom is to be there. Just show up. Show up for your family, for your friends, for your church, for your coworkers, for your neighbors, give of yourself because you know what? It's not all about you. And uh, she still does that to this day. I'd like to talk a little bit about the community that I grew up in, small community that it was. And part of that, uh, the, what I'm gonna talk about mostly is trust that gets built in, in uh, growing up in a small community. You know, you, you're definitely under a microscope, right? Uh, everybody knows everybody's business, but everybody also holds one another accountable. And uh, a tremendous amount of trust gets built as a result. So here's, here's my first story here. Each year at my high school, the seniors were charged with, or they took the responsibility of putting together the annual Academy Awards banquet. And, you know, supposedly that's where awards for different performances that were given throughout the year uh, would be uh, handed out. But it was really more of a variety show, and you had to audition for the seniors who would determine what acts made it into the show. Now, nobody checked scripts, nobody, you know, uh, were overseeing the seniors, making sure that nothing inappropriate got put on the program. They just, they just did it. So I decided to, you uh, I, this, this is not me. I, uh, I could not locate a photograph of myself, but I, I decided to audition as a sophomore to, uh, with a Roseanne, Rosanna Dana routine, which essentially was a roast of our drama slash English teacher. <laughs> now the seniors, the seniors absolutely loved this audition. They loved it, so they said, you are in. And I'm sure after I left, they said, oh my goodness, Mr. O'Brien is gonna have a cow. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, he loved it. Uh, and, uh, you know, isn't a roast the highest form of flattery? I, I don't know, but he, he loved it. And by the end of the night, I was booked to do another Roseanne, Rosanna Dana gig. So, uh, so what are the lessons here? Uh, first of all, trust your students and trust your kids. They know where the line is. Uh, also, trust your instincts. You know where the line is and you know what's in good taste and what isn't. But most importantly, let your children do stuff for themselves. They're always more creative than, than we are as adults, and they're infinitely braver. So, so I, I think uh, you know the fact that my community kind of allowed us to do those kinds of things was, was awesome. 
So then I went on to college, and in high school, I was involved in a lot of things. Academics were important, uh, but so was music and, and athletics. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to do any more of, of this type of thing when I get to college? After all, you know, even though I was, I was pretty good in my high school, I was going to a college of 12,000 students. I, I thought, I just, I just don't know if, if I can measure up. Well, some people come into your, lives, uh, your life at just the right time. And for me, it was the summer before I started college. My brother and I were singing at my cousin's wedding. You know, of course, right? Uh, so in preparation for this, the accompanist happened to be a, a music major, a music performance major at the university that we would be attending. And she strongly encouraged me to audition. And she talked me into it. So I went to the audition, and it's, you know, burned into my memory. That audition, it was successful. It led to countless hours of rehearsals, performances, a couple of theater parts, uh, you know, countless friendships and that, I, that I still have to this day. And I thought, wow, if not for her, I may not have done it. So what I would say is don't be afraid to be that difference maker for somebody else. Encourage somebody to go for it. Just do it. I think you can do it because that's the little shove that sometimes we need. Now, get the life partner decision right, okay? <laughs> it, if, it's not the, if it's not one of the most important, it, it's the most important decision you make. And always remember that you're growing and changing. Your spouse is growing and changing, so you better do a lot of talking. Talk and talk and talk, and then talk some more. And then stir in some love and patience and forgiveness and trust, and then you've, you've got it right, I think. Uh, and it really is so much fun. It really is, every stage uh, along the way. And Jim has taught me so many things. Um, now, you know, I look at this now, it's like, wow, he, he, we don't always take his picture when he's holding something dead. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, I guess we do. <laughs> Ser seriously, I, I really have had a lot of a lot of fun with him, and uh, what I've absolutely learned is, you know, all of all of his passions don't have to be my passions, but it really helps if at least one of them uh, is shared. Uh, no, don't get idea. Okay, so for us. One of those was, was curling, and is curling, but it, it took me a little bit of time to catch the curling bug, but now that I have it, it's, it's, it's uh, really ingrained in me. Uh, but it really is important to, to support one another's passions. Um, you know, seem interested in, in your partner's passions, even if you're not, because, you, <laughs> you know, eventually you might become more interested, and then he'll love you for it. He'll appreciate it. And then there's more things that you can share together. You know, and Jim always believed in me, even when I uh, didn't believe so much in myself. And everybody needs somebody wonderful like that who, who really knows that you can do it. And he's also supported my passion. Uh, when I had this crazy idea to pursue a PhD at the University of South Carolina when we were living in Minneapolis, uh, and I wanted to quit my really good job and do this, he said, if that's what you really want to do, let's go. I can teach anywhere, and honk and kiss. Uh, <laughs> l let's go. <clears throat> you know, when that happens, you know you've got a partner in life for life. Babies, okay? Just do it. Just, just, <laughs> just have them, you know? <clears throat> uh, until you do this, you can't grasp the vastness of your ability to love. And you're, you'll never understand your parents or your gra grandparents and why they love you so much and think you're so awesome. Uh, really, children, children do that for us, and they put our lives in perspective. You know, I, I, they, they make it clear about what you should be doing right now. <laughs> I never felt like I was missing out on anything. I thought, oh, isn't it great? I get to do this just because I have kids. I get to go and do this and have fun acting like a kid. Uh, you know, I told our children in the past, I said, why do you think Dad and I had you in the first place? You're, you're just entertainment for us. <laughs> you know? You're not cheap entertainment, but you're, but you're definitely entertaining. Um, plus, look at all the great life stories that you have just because they're around, you know. Uh, I've shared uh, hundreds of stories with them, and now they're getting really good, and they have been really good about sharing their stories with, with us, too. 
And of course, children are always paying attention to everything, and even when you think they aren't, even when they're teenagers, they're listening, and then they're spot on impersonations of you uh, uh, help you realize this. And I would encourage you to you know, share your passions with your kids too. Uh, you know, Chloe loves to curl, we love to curl, so we get to do that together. We get to enjoy her and watch her and, and Hunter with his baseball. You know, sometimes they're gonna share your passion. Sometimes they're not. You know, so, so, so you, you, you know, I mean, but you know what? They tried it. Uh, and, and all the time we're building relationships. All the time we're talking about, about this and that. And it's, it's really all good. Children also bring hundreds of additional people into your life. Uh, some of those people become your dear friends. And how wonderful. More of life to share and more meaning to create. Uh, you know, the, how does that happen? I mean, I don't even know. Uh, now, Hunter's on the left, and Chloe, of course, is the only girl in the picture. But, but then the other thing that happens is that boyfriend shows up. And I, you know, you're never ready for that. But he's a, he's a very nice guy. So, <laughs> right, right, Jim? He's a good guy. Okay. So, Chloe and Hunter basically are absolutely the best decisions we didn't make. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they, just, they just happen. Uh, okay, all right, TMI, Julie, TMI. okay, all right. So I gotta talk a little bit about, about my work and about the word vocation. You know, one little change of a letter and you have a vacation, right? I, I, I don't think I'm the only one who thought of that. Uh, but you're like, seriously, Joy, seriously? Uh, but you know what, if you're passionate about your work, uh, it may seem uh, not so much like work. And I would encourage uh, all of us to be sure to take time to see the good in what you do. Spend time reflecting on it. You'll be amazed at just how much good that you do for others and for yourself. And for me, teaching is it. Uh, you know, and I chose business because, you know, basically I, I'm interested in it and that's uh, my passion. It's really applied sociology, it's applied economics, and it's applied psychology. But it's also an act of creation. Business creates value, it creates re more relationships, it creates work and career opportunities, and we create meaning. So if I really think it's an act of creation, that had better come across in my teaching too. Uh, so for me, like I would say most professors, my biggest and most important professional legacy are my students. Now I only get a brief time with each of them, so I need to make that time matter and I need to make sure that each student knows that the time that I spend with them does matter. So I always try to ask meaningful questions and require meaningful responses. I assign meaningful work, at least I try to. Uh, and I make sure that they know I expect their very best. And I always try to show them that I care, not only about their performance in my class, but about them as, as human beings. Here's another story. A few years ago, I had a student, I'll, I'll call her Trish, although that, that wasn't her name. But she was my advisee and my student, and she came to me a few days before she graduated from St. Norbert with a little gift. I know this is hard for you to believe, but I don't usually get gifts. <laughs> but, but anyway, so it was really nice. Uh, it was really nice. That's not a hint to any of my students who happen to be. Uh, but it is really nice. Uh, so so, so uh, she, I said, well, Trish, thank you so much. And she said, you know, I was gonna drop my business major when I was a sophomore until I came and talked to you that day. And I'm thinking, I don't remember that day so much, but she kind of refreshed my memory. She said, you know, uh, someone had told me that they didn't think I had what it took to be a business major. And I, I shared that with you and, and, uh, and I remember that you said, that's ridiculous, you're, you're in my stats class, you're performing well, uh, you're just getting started on the business curriculum. I, I don't see it, Trish. Are, are you interested in the major? Yes, I really want to do it. I said, well, I think you, you've got all the, all the, the tools to make yourself a, a successful business major. And she said, you know, that made a huge difference to me. And, uh, you know, I, I guess, so to me, those little conversations and those little comments really matter even when, when we think they, they don't. You know, we don't necessarily hold on to all those consciously in the long term, but they really do matter. 
So as educators, we have enormous responsibilities here. So if you make a comment, watch out. It's gonna make its way into a notebook uh, or maybe onto Facebook um, or into the memory bank of some young adult. Uh, so make those comments constructive and always keep the learner in mind. One thing that reminds me of this on a fairly frequent basis are the messages that I receive from former students. On any given day, you know, I'll get an email or a, a Facebook message from a, a former student telling me that, oh, I thought of your class today during a meeting, or I thought of a case that we did while I was preparing a presentation for a client, or I thought of a comment that you made while I was preparing to meet with an employee or they just call me to give me a hard time about the Vikings, okay? <laughs> so, so, so you never know what, what they might call out. But you know, it's my hope that for every one student who takes the time to write uh, or to contact me, there are many others who think of those, those moments and think of those connections and just don't have the time to do so. You know, the learning process really is pretty unpredictable. And uh, educators, we can't always know what's going to resonate with, with which students. So we have to try different approaches and we have to be really super well prepared so that we can be flexible in our approach. And I think that's a little ironic. You know, some of that preparation comes right in the days before the, the class, but a lot of it comes in just day-to-day -day living uh, when you're thinking about, oh, you know, that's interesting. I can use that here to illustrate this topic or this would be a great story to tie this, uh, these two topics together. And of course, my favorite approach is to riff on something a student says and then they're engaged and it's, it's an emergent process that no one knows exactly how it's gonna turn out, but you're in it together. And that's really, really exciting stuff. Okay, now this is, these are just some last minute thoughts, all right? So I'm wrapping it up here. Go to stuff, go do stuff, okay? The only regrets I have in my, in my life are the things that I didn't go to, like, birthday parties and Sunday dinners and baptisms and weddings that I just, I just couldn't make it. Uh, so, you know, this kind of ties in with my mom's lesson to me, which is just show up and give of yourself uh, because you can't get those opportunities back. They're there, they're gone, so go to stuff. The second thing is go try new things. You know, I tried, uh, well, first of all, I tried hunting. I wasn't so good at it. But you know what, uh, Jim loved that I tried. And I, maybe I'll keep trying, we'll, we'll see. Fishing, I tried fishing. I'm pretty good at fishing, but I'm smart enough to realize the only reason I'm, I'm good at fishing is because the driver of the boat puts me where the fish are. And then I was like, well, what's so hard about this, you know? <laughs> Come on. Okay, but curling, you know, curling, I, I, I waited a long time to try it. And then once I tried it, you know, I loved it. And I get to do it, like I said, with my family sometimes. And I've met hundreds of people because I just tried something new. And they're my friends now too. Uh, also, be all in, all right? Be present, be in the moment. Give those in your presence your full attention. You know what I love about little kids? And I was reminded of this when I was finding these old photographs. You know, when, when your kids are like two and three and four, they'll take your, your face in their hands, right? And they'll demand your full attention, mommy. You know, listen to me now. And, and so I, I think of that because I think that adults would love to do that sometimes. You know, listen to me now. So, so do, do that, you know, do that for others. You know, don't you know, actually literally do it, but I don't know, maybe. Uh, but, but I think that's, that would be awesome. If everyone did that, you know, was fully present in the moment, uh, that, would, that would be great and then see and make the connections between all kinds of things that are going on in your life, things that you're learning, things that you know, things that you want to experience. And uh, you know, if a thought keeps nagging at you, there's probably a reason, follow, follow up on that. And you know, lastly, but not leastly, laugh. Laugh often, laugh at yourself, laugh at other people, laugh at your students, they're, they're really funny. Uh, because you know, it's always something, <laughs> it's always something. So. That's it, that's it for me. So thanks for your time.
thoughts. One, one is there's a picture in my house somewhere of Joy and my husband playing skee ball at Chuck E. Cheese. So she's serious <laughs> about your children bringing you back to your youth, and it's a joyful thing. Um, and, and secondly, just go for it. Obviously, the woman lives what she says because uh, when she was invited to be in the first semester roster of these lectures, she graciously said yes. Again, thank you all for being here. A reminder that hospitality is available if your schedule allows um, to stick around and have a bite and uh, enjoy some more time together. And uh, finally, would you join in, in thanking Joy once again.